Um, our scripture reading this morning uh, comes from Romans chapter 12, uh, reading verse 1 through to 5. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 1 through to 5. It is under the head, heading, a living sacrifice to God. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. This is the word of the Lord. I forgot this one. Good morning. Special welcome to you all. Um, I am also very aware that we have a number of visitors uh, this morning um, because of, of the special day of Lutando's baptism. And I see some of the old members in the, in the family of St. Mangos and just want to welcome you. Welcome uh, those who are worshiping with us online. We hope that this time will just be a time that we spend and reflect together um, at the feet of the cross. Um, we started the true spirituality this past Wednesday. Um, we know that it started with a bumpy, bumpy, bumpy road, uh, but grateful that despite all the Lord has saw us through. And I, I have received so many comments from people who, um, who did, uh, were able to log in on Wednesday, um, just sharing with me how meaningful they found, they have found the journey to be. And we hope that this is what um, the Lord will do as we, as we move forward. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Today we are in the second message of a true spirituality. And as you would have seen that the theme for today is how to give God what he wants the most. The most. And we, we are basing the journey uh, on Romans 12. It is um, becoming 
Helmans 12 Christian. So um, we hope that the story and what Paul relates in Romans 12 will continue to shape your understanding and the journey as we go through this together. Linda Thornton talks a lot about leadership and ethical thinking. But in, in dealing with ethical thinking, he wants for, for, for her listeners to see how ethical thinking influences decision making or rather that decisions that we make have to be influenced by our ethical thinking and so he says she says that we require to stay grounded in the ethical values if we are going to be ethical in our decision making, we have to be grounded in ethical values. But there is more to this because when we are steered on the road by our ethical values, we realize that there is much to know of our values and how we have to live by these values each and every day of our lives. And how these values, when we cling to them, when we understand them, when we have embraced them, they influence the choices that we make in life. But it is not only an easy thing to approach any decision making by saying, these are my ethical values. We also bring into the mix the understanding that any decisions that we have to make based on our ethical values is quite complex. And so complexity becomes in the way of life. To make ethical decisions, we must embrace complexity and we must incorporate it into our thinking processes. And this will mean that we dig deeper into the issues until we understand how multidimensional they are. We seek connections. We look at the contradictions. It also means that we become very intentional about the decision-making processes. And we, we avoid making any snap judgments. When we have come to a place where we can do a thinking and very conscious of complexities, it's such a huge help. Because it helps us to sift through the challenges that we face, the problems, but above all the opportunities that are presented. Chip Ingram has put three case studies that will become part of our study as we move into this week. And these case studies, although fictional, they 
also help us to understand the challenges of these complexities. So he, he has pulled his two case studies from Harvard University a Business School, and he put them that people cited in these case studies, at the core, they had a huge challenge. One first case study is John. John secretly discovered rare civil war coins. And he wants these coins. But realizes that he needs 95 thousand dollars to acquire to secure them and he does not have that money the only thing that he could do was to sell the house and some of the properties and things that he that he owned together with his wife so that he can acquire this so he has to break this news to his wife. And maybe together they need to explore how do we raise the balance of what we need to, to acquire these properties. And so he says that is a challenging decision that they have to make. And not only it's making decision, it's to weigh the pros and cons. Are the coins more important than where they live? What is of priority in his life? What is important? The second one is a young lady called the Sheila. Say she's a poor college art student and comes into contact with Picasso original. She's a collector of art and she wants to acquire this beautiful piece. It will be one of the best in her collection. It is $25,000, but she only has 600. How does she raise the balance to acquire this? And then the third one, and this is where I want to dwell, this is where I want to make an entry point. It's the one in Matthew 13 is the story that you will know very well. Matthew 13, reading two verses, only two verses, verses 44 to verse 45, and listen to it. It's the parable that Jesus tells, a parable of the hidden treasure in the pearl. The kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for a fine pearls, when he found one of great value, he went away, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then 
in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for the pearls when he found one of great value. He went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. How do we give God what he wants most? How do we make a crucial sacrifices so that we can give God what he wants? Stuart Strengthen Jr. put it this way. How do you define what it means to make a sacrifice? We say we sacrifice our family or sacrifice our careers. We speak of Jesus as sacrificing himself so that we can experience eternal life. Augustine of Hippo, the great North African bishop, defined sacrifice as the surrender of something of value for the sake of something else. Which in itself begs the question, what are you willing to sacrifice? And for whom or what? Every day we make decisions based on our priorities. Of those priorities, a sacrifice one thing for another thing. Sadly, we often fall into habits where we no longer can recognize in all these our selfishness, our self-centered priorities. If sacrifice is, as Augustine once said, the surrender of something of value for the something, for the sake of something else, then what are you surrendering for the sake? of Christ and his kingdom. Chip Ingram will remind us, this too remind me of the case study by Jesus that teaches us also about risk, about reason, about decision-making process. When Jesus is teaching, here we, we are reminded that at the core of this is what we see as the most important thing in our lives. Will we risk investing in this pearls, will we sacrifice everything that we have so that we can acquire this? What is it that you want to give? What is it that you want to surrender? What is it that you want to give to God? How do you respond to God when he wants you to offer your very selves too. The reading in Romans, it's a reminder of what God wants from us. It's a reminder of what we are challenged by God to give. A reminder that there is more that God seeks from us that he wants us to offer to him. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies. So, we need to understand that 
God want from us to offer your body. You offer it. You make a decision to offer your body. And the stakes, when we read here, the stakes are high. God does not grab. God does not take. God has opened for you and you have to respond. It's a decision that we have to make willingly. We have to respond to that invite in our personal capacity. You have to decide whether you give God your life or not. It's your decision. It's your call. And it's like God saying, I won't take less from you. I, I'm not expecting you to give me less than what I want. Because if you understand, if you are at a point where you have decided to offer yourself, you have to understand that the, the implication of what I seek from you is the total surrender. You offer and you surrender. You give me all of yourself. You give me all of your heart. You give me all of your life. And when we do that, we, we realize that whatever we have is, is a gift from God. There is nothing that we can claim as our own. Our mere ability to breathe is a gift of God. We emerge from quite a difficult time in the world with the pandemic, where God has pushed us to the place where we have become helpless and realize that there is nothing that we can do on our own. No matter how powerful we think we might be, the resources that we have, the advance in the technology, advances that we have made in the medical care. Millions and millions and millions of people around the world have lost their lives. With our capabilities and our understanding and advances in medicine. We were pushed to a place where we became helpless and realized that there is nothing that we can do without God. And this offer that God expects, he expects us to give, offer our bodies. And these bodies become a living sacrifice. You will, you will know as we read the Old Testament of the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices that the priests were offer on behalf of people. They were offered for the forgiveness of sins, for the restoration, for purification. And Jesus become the huge sacrifice for us. Because his life, and especially his death, 
become the atoning grace of God to us at Calvary. That through that, the death of Jesus, we, we are saved. And so from him we learn what it is to sacrifice your lives for another. Because he sacrificed his life so that we can stand here today redeemed and forgiven. So what God expects, what God demands from us, what he wants us to give him, what he wants most from us, it's when we, we understand that, that we have to live life of sacrifice. That we are called more often to sacrifice our lives. For the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of our fellow men, for the sake of our world. And this is what pleases God. This is what God will look at our lives and be joyful that we, we have captured the essence, the essence of living lives as the disciples of Jesus Christ. The total commitment The surrendering of life is what pleases God, is what gives glory to him. It is the huge worship that we can show to God. That our lives, our bodies, Every minute that we live, any action that we take, any resources that we have gathered, any breath that comes from our bodies, we offer them to God in worship. It's our sign of worship. As we look at the demands of God, look at the challenges that we face in the world. When we look at our lives and maybe some other things become quite difficult to part with. We realize how change has to happen in the way we look at the world and the way we make the decision. And so that is why Paul say that in order to surrender, you will have to experience a mental transformation. You have to change. There is no way that you, you will give God what he wants until we, we have surrendered. Surrendered our thoughts so that we will look at the world and we sing through him. Imagine when that happened. When we, when we are influenced in such a way that the way we look at the world and the way we see the world, we see them through the eyes of God. Any decision that we make 
is informed by the word of God. It is formed by, by his morality. It is informed by his justice. It is informed by his concern. It is informed by his love. It is informed by his mercy and by his grace. And so when, when, we, when we look at each and every situation, it is him that informs us. Joseph Flesher has written quite a lot in, in ethical decision making. And one of, one of um, the powerful studies that he made was that whenever we, we are sent into an ethical decision making situation, it is sometimes prudent for us to put anything aside and come into that situation armed with only one tool, love. So when we, when we have to decide, when we have to make decisions, sometimes very complex decisions, the question that we ask ourselves is, in this situation, how can love best be served? So that when we arrive at that decision, it is informed by the love of God. In Genesis chapter 22, there is a familiar story that you understand very well. In this gripping account, God asks Abraham to present his only one son, Isaac, as a sacrifice. In obedience, the two of them set out carrying items needed for making an offering to the Lord. When they arrive at a designated spot and Abraham started to make preparation, Isaac asked, Dad, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God will provide. Abraham bound Isaac and laid him on top of the wood on the altar. Just as he was about to slay his son with a knife, the Lord intervened and provided a ram for the burnt offering. And God honored Abraham's willingness to sacrifice that which was most valuable to him, his son, in faith when he put Isaac on the altar. You know the story um, of, of Abraham and Isaac uh, for in the, New in the Old Testament the studies and the biblical studies, it foreshadowed the story of Jesus himself, that God gave his only son so that through his death, we, we will be redeemed and saved. What is it that you are willing to sacrifice? What is it that you are willing to surrender? How will you want your life to meet what God requires of you? The main and the only thing that God desires to have. And will you give God what he wants the most in your life? Just as we come to the end of this time, let me tell you a story related by Francis Chen. 
He tells that story of a man and a couple, Domingo and Irene. He is a mechanic and she is a hairdresser. They have been forced foster parents to 32 children and have adopted a 16. Domingo and Irene are in their late 50s and currently have 11 children living with them. And they tell, they tell me they would take them more if they could. Anyone who has children knows they could be doing this only by the spirit power. While other people their age are figuring out how to live most comfortably, they can't, they can't stop thinking of 500,000 kids in America who need parents. And while they see these kids as a huge blessing, they are also very open about the hardship they face daily. And God has provided for them over and over again. One of the wonderful blessings they have enjoyed is watching their biological children follow in their footsteps by adopting children. They live such extraordinary lives that the CBC News ran a story on them. Even the secular world notices the unusual and supernatural love these two have shown to those in need. For those who may think that Domingo and Irene have always been gracious as they are today, let me share some insight from their past. Irene, in the early days of their marriage, hated Domingo. He was abusive, and she prayed regularly that he would die. She even daydreamed about his driving off a cliff because of the pain he inflicted on her. Now, she calls him the godliest man she knows. And Francis ended this story by saying, for anyone who thinks that their own life or marriage is hopeless, remember Domingo and Irene. God loves to take people in the worst of situation and transform them by his spirit. In her book, It Only Hurts When I Laugh, Ethel Barrett tells how four outstanding servants of God died to self and sin. Judge Muller, when questioned about his spiritual power, responded simply, one day George Muller died. D.L. Moody was visiting New York, New York when, when he consciously died to his own ambitions. Pastor Charles Sefini slipped away to a secluded spot in a forest to die to self. An evangelist, Christmas Evans, putting down on paper his surrender to Christ, began it by writing, I give my soul and body to Jesus. It was, in a very real sense, a death to self. John McGregory Mantel wrote, There is a great difference between realizing on that cross, he was crucified for me. And that cross, I am crucified with him. The one aspect that brings us deliverance from sin's condemnation 
the other one from the power of sin. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen.